next to 30 minutes, I will stand up. Okay. How about that? If you get there. We've uh, reloaded and reprogrammed, and so welcome. Thank you, um, commissioners, for this opportunity. My name is Tom Krasminski. I'm uh, the director of the Public Defender's Office. To my left is Matt Hargett. He's our chief deputy. Um, we also have uh, Julie Curtis, our office manager, and Greg Beeman, our supervisor uh, of investigators. Uh, the four of us are management. We have 81 staff that we supervise. Uh, so you can imagine we're a little bit outnumbered. Uh, but uh, we, we uh, do our best. And um, again, I, I, I'm pleased to be here today to, to talk about public defense uh, services, but also the, the broader picture of, of, of criminal justice. Uh, Council for Defense is also present. We have Jeremy Schmidt. And Diane Mueller, um, Scott Mason was um, unavailable today uh, to, to attend. I know you have their slides, and I'm more than I talked to Scott yesterday, and and I'm more than happy to to leave some time for any uh, presentation by their office or questions that you may have. I don't plan on on reading through my slides. I, I will draw attention to a few of them as I go along. Uh, I, I'm I been in many presentations, as I'm sure you have too, where sometimes you kind of get bogged down and just are presenting through slides. But I think there's important issues that, that I can address today, and hopefully it'll um, trigger some discussion. Public defense in, in Spokane County is, is performed at a, an extremely high level. Uh, the Public Defender Office, Council for Defense, and private attorneys that are under contract work every day to assist clients through an extremely, extremely difficult system to navigate. If you've ever seen what was put together um, after we received or in the process of working uh, up the MacArthur grant, we, we filled an entire wall with a start to finish what happens to an individual that enters into the criminal justice system. And we as defense attorneys are there to, to navigate, to help these individuals, and to somehow get them out of that system as quickly as possible. While overall uh, funding for, for public defense is, uh, or for those that are accused, um, is not always looked upon very favorably, um, the work that we do does, does create a substantial savings to, to taxpayers. And as you can see, um, this is the average cost of, of the private attorneys that we contract with uh, to do our additional conflict work, a little over $1,300, where the average cost of keeping a case in-house in the public defender's office runs about $700. So I, in my humble opinion, we provide great service for $700 a case. We have um, always enjoyed uh, a, a great relationship with the budget office. We appreciate the, we, uh, the, the support that we receive year in, year out from that office. Uh, a year does not go by where towards the end of the year we are asking for additional funds to, to, to get us through. And all those requests have been met in the past. And again, it's, it's greatly appreciated. It makes our job a lot easier. My lack of providing specific cuts as requested, I, I, I hope it's not interpreted as being disrespectful of the budget shortfall or the, dis, the difficult decisions you as county leaders have to make. Uh, my proposal of, of no reduction to public defense is based on data regarding our caseloads, Supreme Court standards for indigent defense, and the county resolution that was adopted in 2013. In other words, we don't have any areas that we can cut. If the, a decision is made to eliminate part of our budget uh, as it has existed, what that would mean is diverting cases, diverting cases to private attorneys because we have met our caseload standards and again, the cost would be higher to uh, the taxpayer.
you heard from, from Mr. Haskell earlier, and he's just one part of the criminal justice system uh, that touches a case before we even see it. The, the, the public defender's office does not control the number that comes in. We don't control the type of cases that come in. You can see from this slide, Spokane County, based on population, is the highest felony charging county in the state. Three times as high as King County, almost twice as high as Clark County, almost three times as high as Snohomish. That is significant. Those are decisions ma being made by law enforcement, by the prosecutor's office before the case even comes to our door. Law enforcement initiates contact. They decide if there's going to be a site or an arrest. The prosecutor then decides what type of charge to file. Pretrial services then has that individual in front of them for a screening and a review and only then, upon approval, is the case sent to our office. Once the case comes in, in all cases, all clients come into the public defender office initially. So we have individuals in our office that start the screening process once it comes in. And a decision is made at that point whether we can keep the case in the public defender's office or if there is a conflict. If there is a conflict, the first office we look to is Council for Defense, another county agency, that we can send that case to. So if it's a felony or a juvenile case, a juvenile delinquency case, we can send it to Council for Defense. If it's a misdemeanor conflict, we have an agreement, a mutual agreement with the city public defender's office, and we exchange cases at no cost to either office. So it's one example of where we work very closely with the city. But right now, that, that agreement is just for misdemeanor cases. If we cannot send it to one of those other agencies, then we have to look to private counsel. And we have a, a, a list of private attorneys that we use. For our own cases, we closely monitor the number. And the number is based on Supreme Court standards that went into place in 2012. So the standard towards the right-hand column there, for felony cases is 150 per attorney per year, for juvenile it's 250, and for misdemeanor it's 400. So we closely, closely watch that. Um, every week, every month, we are looking at those numbers to make sure our attorneys don't go over. Um, I always use the baseball analogy. We have nobody in the bullpen to call in if we start to go over in these numbers. There's, there's no room there for us to try to find some attorney that could come in that's a county employee that can take over these cases. And as you can see, in 2016, we were very close to maximum on the felony. Uh, juvenile was over and misdemeanor was over. I, I could explain that further, but it would take some time. How no one was actually over, but the numbers coming in were over. And again, I could explain that in detail later if needed. But for 2017, we're looking at basically the, the same situation. Um, in terms of where we're at at this point in the year with our caseloads. Another um, important um, number that we monitor is the work of our investigators in the office. And what we looked in, what we found in looking at the data is that as the number of cases being called ready for trial, and the number of trials that we see, which has risen, um, what, what does that mean for our investigators? And, and, and you can see uh, the numbers keep going up. 
and significantly, significantly since 2012, with no increase in the number of investigators we have available. And I, I know sometimes the reaction is, well, why do you need to investigate a case? That's already been done. It's been given to you. You have an investigation given to you. Well, we are there to challenge that investigation. We are there to make sure that what we are being told by law enforcement, by witnesses, is accurate and is what really has happened. And I can give you two examples from this year, two homicide cases this year that went to trial, one in counsel for defense, one in our office, that the individuals were found not guilty. And, and you think about that, a significant, maybe the most significant charge that can ever be levied against an individual. In those two cases this year, 12 individuals unanimously agreed that. So we do our job, the investigators do their job and they do it well and as you can see, they are becoming overloaded. As I mentioned earlier, guidance for our assignment of cases comes from the, Sur the Supreme Court's standards that were adopted in 2012. And I can tell you from um, participating in some MacArthur work um, uh, and meeting with members of the public defense community from across the country, Many jurisdictions do not have caseload standards. I think we are fortunate that we do. I think it, um, even though it's a, a discussion point of what's appropriate, uh, a lot of jurisdictions just do not have these caps and their lawyers uh, end up spending sometimes only minutes with clients before they make a decision on whether that person should plead guilty or accept some type of plea bargain. And again, with no investigation being done when, when you have heavy caseloads. Uh, but the Supreme Court took this step. And then shortly thereafter, in 2013, um, and obviously, Commissioner French, you see your signature on there, uh, there was a resolution adopted that, that the county said, we are going to follow these standards, that we are not only going to um, agree with the number of cases that should be assigned to attorneys, but also the support staff that goes along with it. That you have the facility, the private confidential facility to meet with clients, that you have support staff, paralegals, investigators. And I will tell you, since um, these standards went into place, we, we may have added attorneys to meet the caseload standards, but we have not added support staff. We just have not had that in our budget and more attorneys, more work for support staff, but the same number that's trying to, to take care of these individuals and more importantly, take care of the clients. So in, in many regards, we are doing more with less and that's why it's very difficult to face a budget um, shortfall for next year. In addition, attorneys sign certifications that was also part of the supreme court decision and these these certifications uh, are the attorney saying for the next quarter i meet the standards that my caseload is right and my support is right and we have been fortunate up to this point over the last few years that we have 100 percent with our attorneys been able to file those certificates um, and that's uh, it, again, it's very difficult to make sure that their needs are being met. And I give credit to the staff in the office for being able to prepare cases, to work with the attorneys. Um, but these certifications are very important and they're um, what, what governs our work daily in the office. As I as I said, I, I, I struggled initially with this project um, and, and trying to see if we could come up with a monetary cut. My decision was that we could not. But I, I do believe that I can offer some suggestions on how to offer defense services more um, efficiently. And as a result, there will be monetary savings to the taxpayer. 
I believe this whole process has given us a, a unique opportunity to self-evaluate and to propose some change. The, there are two changes that we propose, the, the first being a, a, a second conflict office. Um, another way to put it would be a third public defender office. And uh, secondly, creating an administrative office from existing personnel. Let me first talk about the, uh, the conflict office. We, we can do this from existing funds. We can create this new office from existing funds. And the existing funds come from the money that's allocated for private attorney conflicts. Uh, the private attorneys, once they get a case, it's their case. Public Defender Office has no control over it. Let me give you an example. If a public defender needs a expert, let's say a DNA expert, they will come to myself or to Matt and they will have a conversation with us and we will question them. Um, usually they don't like that um, to be challenged, but, but we wanna make sure, we wanna hear their thought process, we wanna hear their strategy, we wanna provide some guidance and advice. And a lot of times we can talk it through so we are using taxpayer money in the most efficient manner and the best manner for that client. And we'll typically put some caps on that, at least initially, uh, and we will um, allow the expert to be hired. Once a case goes to private counsel, they're not coming to myself or Matt, it's a conflict. So they go to the court. And they make an argument to the judge saying we need this. And, and I know from having conversations with judges, they kind of struggle with this, but for the most part, they are going to agree and say, okay, you need this expert service, so they'll sign an order allowing it. Once that takes place and that expert is um, working, the bill comes back to the public defender's office for payment. So it comes out of our expert money, um, which is something obviously we have no control of and sometimes can be a little shocking to us, the dollar amounts and what was approved. So we believe that if a, a third office is established, it would have two attorneys and one investigator. The two attorney proposal is based on the number of cases that went out in 2016 to private counsel, which was approximately 260. So if you think about the caseload numbers, and that was a combination of adult felony, misdemeanor, uh, occasional misdemeanor, some don't always go to the city, and, and, and juvenile cases. Uh, and then the expert and investigative fees that went along with those private attorney cases. So we believe we can use existing funds to get this office up and running and to do it very efficiently. And the hope down the road that we can maybe combine some services, especially in the, in the area of investigative services, because I know they struggle there. I have had multiple conversations with Kathy Knox over at the City Public Defender. So we believe we could possibly share some work and share the cost. Um, so again, a, a, a third office, um, which would also, in my opinion, assist counsel for defense. Sometimes they get, there's periods of time where they may get overrun with class A, the, the most difficult um, and serious charges. They may get three, four, five, six of those in in a given month. And, be, and, and, and being a small office, it's hard to spread that out. Uh, but we believe that the additional office would help in that area. The administrative office, I believe, can also come out of existing personnel. So it's taking a look at what services are provided that can be combined. Uh, not everything that we do necessarily um, amount to a conflict where a second office has to handle that work. Case assignments are not necessarily a conflict. Payroll 
is not a conflict. Approving some um, investigative and expert services may not be a conflict. Um, so there are, there, there's definitely areas where an administrative office could help guide defense work and do it in such a manner that there should be a savings back to the county. Pima County, Arizona is an example of a jurisdiction that implemented such a model. The, over, the overall result for them has been a, a substantial decrease in defense cost and an increase in the quality of defense services. They have provided additional training and resources for their attorneys based on this model. While the savings may not meet this target percentage that has been proposed this year, I believe it is the right um, approach to take for the future of defense services in Spokane County. I believe it would limit that occasional outlier um, criminal case that cost the county a substantial amount of money, and we did have one this year that had to go to private counsel. Um, that goes well beyond the contract that we enter into with attorneys for $1,400 because of the type of case and the type of needs, investigative services and experts that were required on that case. And we have those. We have those every few years. Council Defense for Defense was started because of that type of situation. Um, my memory was there was a death penalty case that had to be moved out of the public defender's office to private counsel pre-1997. That cost a significant amount of money. But now we have offices, well, we have one office that can handle it. But if they have a conflict, we are looking for that third office to help with the costs. So I believe there are things that we can do. Um, if you're familiar with criminal trials, the prosecutor in, in closing argument, the prosecutor goes first and the public defender goes next. <laughs> so I feel like that's sort of happened today. Um, but usually the prosecutor then gets to get up again and rebut, but no prosecutor. So I'm feeling pretty good right now. Um, questions? Questions for? So, um, what is the threshold, um, uh, financial threshold, to determine whether uh, they qualify for um, uh, public defender uh, cost to be covered by the county as versus the the defendant paying for the legal cost? Can I defer to sure. Ms. Cox? Yeah, no, you services? bet. Well, that's that's Need to come to the mic, but we're not going to swear you in. No. <laughs> so I guess um, if you could rephrase the question more specifically. So I'm, I'm I'm trying to put my arms around indigent defense, and you know the 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 state uh, ultimately should be reimbursing us for that. They don't. Um, we provide legal services to those that cannot pay. Um, what is the threshold to determine whether they pay or not? So what, what we use in Washington State is um, it's 125% of the federal poverty guideline. And we have, um, you know, we have a, a matrix that we've developed with um, income levels, um, dependents, income assets, all those things are factored in. What our indigency rate here in Spokane County is roughly 88% of those that apply for a public defender will be appointed. Probably another 10% on top of that is with a, a contribution fee. And that's pretty standard across Washington State. The indigency rate is, is um, right in there anywhere from 85 to 98% of those that actually apply. So when somebody applies, um, do, do we actually require them to provide a financial statement or uh, some kind of proof of income level or ability to pay? We don't. Um, everything is, we, we conduct an interview 
they provide the information, um, they sign under penalty of perjury, and if there's any questionable information provided or if it appears that their, that their income can't possibly cover their expenses, if there's uh, questionable information reported to us, then we would request verification. Okay. It's been suggested to me by uh, some of the attorneys in the private sector that, that we provide more free service than we uh, would otherwise be required to if we did a um, uh, maybe a more um, uh, in-depth search on the uh, financial wherewithal of some of the defendants. And so I'm trying to drill into that. Is that a possible revenue source that would uh, help offset some of the cost? And um, actually, funny that you should bring that up. We, we um, have a work group right now that's working on that very issue. We're taking okay. a look at um, recoupment of, of assessed fees versus a promissory note being signed up front. Um, we're taking a look at what different jurisdictions do for verification because the RCW, um, the, the information that they provide is subject to verification, but it's not required. Um, having been here for many years, um, that the subject has come up a number of times and, and often what we have found is that the cost to actually, um, the cost for the time spent to do the verification um, is a higher number than what you actually end up recouping and we're actually looking at that too. What, um, what we recommend to the court as a, a fee for recoupment what's actually imposed by the court, and then at the tail end, what's actually um, being paid in by the defendant. So we're learning a lot. Um, in a perfect world, we'd like to think that what, we, that what we recommend is imposed and that it's ultimately collected, but that's really not the way that it tends to play out. So, okay. um, but like I said, that work group, um, we are meeting on a regular basis, and I think that we're gonna have a lot of interesting findings and recommendations and we'd be happy to share that with you. Any timetable of when you think the group might be completing their work? Um, gosh, we're, I think that we're shooting for the end of the year. Okay. So. Okay. Very good, thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Kearns. Would you be able to assess a fee and require the individual to come in and prove that they can't pay to get the fee waived? And would you be able to? Do it the reverse like that. I, I've been told there's some some courts do it that way. We don't here, but <laughs> no, I, I'm not familiar with with the courts that do it like that in Washington State. Um, although it's entirely possible, I that's probably a legal question that I can't answer. And okay. so I would be contacting my legal counsel and <laughs> with Jim. Okay, and I had a question for Tom. Um, with your, your slide that showed um, Spokane County is being per, per 100,000 of population being the highest of felonies, I mean, why is that? Well, <laughs> the, the, the short answer. <laughs> Am I done? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Trying to be a little delicate, I guess. It's discretion. Um, for example, we see a lot of cases that we look at them and say, could it, this have been charged alternatively? That's, that's not our job. I mean, we, we, we will use that as a negotiation tactic, or we may use that in front of a jury to ask for a lesser included will say, yes, our client did do this, but it doesn't amount to what they charged him with. And some examples. Um, one that we talk about all the time is the Walmart um, theft, shoplifting. That's really a misdemeanor level, but something happens on the way out and there's a push. Touching, um, you know, they're grabbed from behind and they push back and against the, the, the store clerk. Here it's charged as a robbery then. Of course, to retain that property. Does it have to be charged that way? Discretion. Um, I'm not in the business of charging, so, it, but I, I'm, I can look at that and say, well, 
Did it have to be that way? Um, or the trespass that gets charged as a felony burglary. Uh, so the, I, I'd be asking those questions, I, I guess. If I was looking at other jurisdictions, why should, the, do you feel less safe in Spokane than you do in those other counties? Maybe certain parts of the, you know, if you go to certain parts of Tacoma or certain parts of, of um, Seattle, but these other jurisdictions, Snohomish, Clark, I, I, I don't feel less safe in Spokane. So I think those questions need to be asked. And Commissioner French, I think this, I, you know, I've been hearing this a lot. Why isn't the state paying? Why isn't the state paying? Why isn't the state paying? I would say that slide tells you why the state isn't paying. Why would they write a blank check to Spokane County to let law enforcement and the prosecutor's office what they want? I, 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 I wouldn't do that. Um, we get some money from a, a defense, the state defense um, agency called Office of Public Defense. They help us a lot. They help us with those standards. They give us guidance. They worked with the Supreme Court on those standards. Um, they fund some um, dependency, almost all dependency in the state. But they also give us a little bit of money for criminal defense. It's not much. It's a, just a few attorneys that we're able to fund that way. My opinion, just my opinion, um, if we maybe had fewer charges in this jurisdiction, would they possibly be more helpful to us? Maybe. I think that argument could be made. I think an administrator of defense services could be over in Olympia asking for that because that's where they're located. They're right there. Um, but again, that's just my opinion on this. I, 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 we don't have an agency or a group that screens charging. You know, I, I would be, I would be interested to to say, well, let's just as a a group of concerned individuals, let's take 30, 40, 50 cases and walk through them step by step, and see what has been going on in each one of those cases. You know, would we charge it differently? Would we maybe not hold the person in jail as long for different reasons? Um, you know, would, would the outcome be something that would be different? You know, as a collective group, how would we evaluate this case? And I think we might be surprised what we find. Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the reason why I mentioned the end indigent defense uh, issue is that uh, right now the Washington State Association of Counties is uh, frustrated. Uh, the collective uh, group of county commissioners from across the state is frustrated with the state in um, their uh, lack of willingness to fund uh, their commitments from the state level and pushing that down on us. And, and at our last board meeting, we had a conversation about uh, whether it's time to sue the state. And um, uh, the two issues that uh, uh, are top of mind in terms of uh, filing suit against the state is indigent defense uh, and unfunded mandates. And so uh, uh, unfunded mandates, specifically the uh, drop box for mail uh, ballot um, uh, is uh, uh, a clear, we think a clear violation of state statute as it relates to unfunded mandates, but it doesn't generate a big uh, bang for the buck in terms of the amount of money and, and the political risk you, you uh, take on. But uh, engine defense is a major financial burden for counties across the state. And you know, you got the Supreme Court setting caseload standards uh, and then expecting us to finance that uh, out of our general fund and, uh, and yet they're not doing anything to help with regard to the indigent defense. So, that's why I raised the issue. It's, uh, it's top of mind for counties across the state in terms of when is the state going to show up and start carrying their load. And, and Commissioner, I will say, I, you know, when I saw the request for the budget cut, I did call Office of Public Defense and say, can you help me? And they said, oh, we'll write you a letter. <laughs> so <laughs> there was no checks coming, yeah. but they were behind me 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you for the work you do too, Thanks. from your staff.